so um, yeah, general question. Um, so it's interesting, you both were CEOs within the ad industry. How well did you apply your skills to other industries as a CEO? I'm not sure I could go straight into a big company as another CEO, but um, God, certainly, again, <laughs> when I was debating leaving uh, Gray last year, one of my old clients who was retiring as the CMO of HSBC was trying to go and get me to do his job. So I don't think you go straight from being uh, a CEO in an ad agency necessarily to being CEO of something like a giant bank. But I think you can very easily make the move across to CMO and then a lot of CMOs eventually become CEOs. So I think that's probably uh, probably a two-stage process. <laughs> I agree. I think the answer is what Lucy said earlier, which is because you've had incredible insights across a ridiculous range of stuff, and one minute you'll become an expert in telco, and the next minute you're an expert in cars, and then it's mappings or whatever it might be, you are used to and trained to think about different industries and realise that your skills are transferable to those industries. So I think that puts us in a unique position as planners to be able to actually go and do that job, but I'm not sure they would view us that way. <laughs> I don't think they would immediately look to CEOs of advertising or communications to become CEOs of big companies because it just wouldn't dawn on them as a natural jump because your background is communications and marketing and as we know marketing doesn't always get a seat at the very top table yet but I think that might change so I think we are quite uniquely placed to do it but I don't I think it's a long way from probably happening. Yeah I mean I can think of a couple who've done it in um who've gone into big media companies so somebody like a David Abrams who was a CEO of Channel 4 he was chief exec of an ad agency. So I guess that's probably the closest, closest natural fit. Yeah. So uh, you want to describe planning and this, uh, it's a, it's a confusing, this bubble almost, uh, that uh, it's a very comfortable because almost we don't face a certain reality. Do you think it's a problem on how do you um, change this uh, nowadays? Do you mean, you mean in terms of the, the, the breadth of the work you do as a planner? As a, as a, as a type, type of work that, like when you start a uh, CEO, you have to confront the rage of the p the everyday problem, yeah. and human beings in general. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Those damned human beings are everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yes and no, I mean, I think as a planner, you have a very specific, very important job, and it's enough of a job in its own right. Um, I just think that when you, if you're going to become a chief, a chief exec, the natural order of things is suit, 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 suit chief exec eventually. Um, I personally believe that's a really good training for an MD. I'm a bit like Lucy, I'm completely crap at organisation and detail, it's not my passion. And it is a passion for suits, really good suits are just bloody organised, that makes for a very good MD. I think really good chief executives can come from a good strategy and I don't think we're in a I don't think we're in a naive bubble because actually you're not in a bubble. You're spending your entire time thinking about brands and thinking about consumers and thinking about business. That's not a bubble. It's just you don't you don't get waylaid in your everyday job now as a planner by the crap that's been going on in terms of managing that account. And that's kind of fine. Although when you do jump CEO, you do get that crap, and it is a lot of crap. I mean, what I would say is that if you there's a, a big difference between being a planner and running a planning department or running uh, you know, a global planning function. Um, because you are suddenly much more confronted with, well, I've got a salary budget, uh, you know, X isn't performing, Y, blah, 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 all of that stuff. So, you know, even if you want to become, you want to stay as a planner, but you want to progress, um, you're either going to decide, you know what, I'm just going to stay as a stellar planner and I don't like dealing with all that shit. And by the way, that is absolutely fine. There are great planners um, that I've worked with who are super talented in their 50s, who have just gone, you know, that's what I'm good at, that's what I like, I don't need the other crap. Um, but if you do kind of decide you want to do that, then you're going to have to get into that sort of stuff anyway. And what I would say is that um, you have a different conversation with your clients when they know you're responsible for a lot of money. 
So, you know, clients now look at me because I've run a business that had more than 500 people and a large budget and blah, 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 blah. They kind of listen to my advice a little bit more than they would have done if I was just a planner. I know that sounds really unfair because I'm still just the same planner I was, but they just assume that you have a weight that you didn't before, which I don't think is really true, but anyhow, that's what they assume. Any other questions? I really hate this question, but I'm going to ask it. Um, you're both obviously ladies, and four years ago, a lady boss said I should think about gender stuff, and I was like, oh, it doesn't really matter. And now, four years later, being like the number two smart lady to moderately, mediumly okay, intelligent men. Um, I guess what's your advice to that? Because I now, I'm, I don't know, it's hard, it's hard being the first lady. Mm. So, lady advice, I guess, for ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, oh, God, it's so hard because I honestly, I, you know, it took me the second time of being asked if I wanted to be a CEO to actually pick up the balls and say yes and have enough confidence in myself. Um, and you know, they were, I guess, both big companies. Um, and I guess uh, by the time I said yes, I felt a lot more confident in the team around me. And I'd been through more crap. I'd seen how things were really dysfunctional and bad. Um, and actually, I found that to be incredibly useful um, because you kind of go, oh, I can't, I mean, you know, I don't want somebody else to do it and fuck it up. Um, and honestly, that was probably more of a motivator for me. Um, but yeah, it did, I, I'm not sure I'm the right person to be giving any advice because it took me twice to be tapped on the shoulder before I did it. Um, and honestly, it shouldn't be that way. I struggle with lady advice too. Um, <laughs> no, it's um, really lame, and I really didn't think it was an issue, but then when you experience it as an issue, you're like, fuck, this fucking sucks. Yeah, it, um, yeah, I mean, I used to laugh. I used to sit in the global DDB exec meetings, and John Wren knew who I was because everybody else there was a middle aged white 55 year old. So it was kind of like, ooh, is it going to be that? Can be your benefit. You know, yeah, that's a positive. You, you were kind of like, at least he knows my name. <laughs> BCP in the sense that I sort of always have been the most, the only senior female for many years and now there's plenty of us and that's all good but I think likewise it's about you know the classic lean in thing, I read that book, there was a lot in there that was good, there was a lot that was crap but the one thing I remember for that and I've had to take it on as chief exec now is that when you're trying to fill a position and two people come to you and one's a man and one's a woman and you're desperately trying to fill this bloody position, it's a nightmare, because it's the last thing you want to do, you want it's a problem, you want it solved, and the bloke walks in and goes, of course I can do this job, they're ridiculous, I just need to pay me more, I'm brilliant, I've got it all under well control, if this will be sorted, just give me more money, thanks very much, do you want me to do it? And the woman walks in and goes, well, I'm, incredibly, I'm just so incredibly grateful and amazed that you've even bothered to ask me, and I just say, thank you so much, but I just, I do need you to know that I can't do that, and I can't do that, and I can't do that, and I probably can do that, and I'm pretty good at that, but I can't do that, and I can't do that. I you know, really am so grateful. I would love the opportunity. Thank you very much. Please do consider me and graciously goes out backwards. Who are you going to employ at first glance? The one who says they can solve the bloody problem. Of course, now I have learned they're not the one that solves the bloody problem. Yeah, the one that solves the bloody problem is the much more humble woman who comes in and actually is going to work doubly as hard. You know, and, I, you know, and the other woman's problem is, you know, I'm a, I'm a single mum of two boys. And that's bloody hard when you're trying to be a chief exec because... Yeah. I can't be here as much as I want to be here, and I'm certainly not there as much as I want to be there, and I've had to go, and when Adrian asked me to take on the job, he said, I want, this, I want you to do this job, do you want to do it? I said, yes. He said, well, you currently do four days a week. Being a chief exec is not a four-day-a-week job, so you're going to have to go to five days. And I said, I can't do that. I can't do it. I'm not prepared to do it. I can't go to five days a week because I have to be there for my young boys. And he went, oh, well, um, well, well, then you better you better give it a shot on four days and see if you can pull it off. And I and I have and I am, but it's bloody hard. Um, but I so that's hard too. 
and I don't have any advice on that other than there's no good balance. You just have to do the best you can every day and keep buggering on. Yeah, and I, th I think the other the other thing to my point about going off and doing my research, you can use it. I mean, I had my double disability of being a you know a planner and a woman, <laughs> and you do kind of go right. I'm going to go and use it. And people spoke to me about stuff that they wouldn't have done. Um, and also, people are also quite often tend to underestimate you a little bit, which can be really useful. Because then you can just, you know, shit on them later. <laughs> but I mean in stuff like negotiations, I don't mean in general life, but... <laughs> but it can be really helpful when you're kind of negotiating a contract or something like that, because I think there's a natural tendency to assume that I'm quite soft, and I've got a nasty evil side as I've well. Got, I've got the triple advantage, I'm blonde. And a female and planner, so I'm always assumed to be a complete idiot, and that is quite fun. You know, suddenly not. They look quite surprised, most men. Uh, any more questions? Lydia? How long do you think you get comfortable with having um, conversations which are things that planners don't normally deal with? Because I've just moved to a job right now having to talk about like, pricing plans and like timing, all that kind of stuff. How do you think you get comfortable? And not immediately being like, oh, I think that's terrifying. How do you want to do that? Well, as I said, there's plenty that I was terrified of. But of course, you know, you're all bright people. Um, and I, ha I had to kind of keep falling back on, it can't be that hard, you know. It can't be that hard because other people I know around me, suits, and they're no brighter than me, they seem to be able to do this. I just simply don't have the experience. So I'm going to go and get some experience. Or, and if I don't know how to do it, I'm going to ask somebody else and get their help and take that person into the meeting with me and I'm going to really bloody listen. And next time I do it, I'll know a little bit more than I did before. But as I said before, you know, for me, you can't underestimate the value of years and years of experience. You guys don't know how experienced you are in your brand strategy or whatever it is, but you are, you've got so much that you bring to the table every single time you tackle a new thing. Uh, that you don't appreciate you've got until you're suddenly trying to do a complete different job and you're tackling it for the first time again and you're a bit older and you're like, I really haven't done this before. That's when you realise how much experience plays in. So for me, it's only a case of biting the bullet, bloody doing it anyway, getting some help and advice, and then go banking it. I've done it once, I can do it better next time, I can do it easier next time, I won't be scared of it. It's experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, same thing, my FD, I absolutely adored. Um, yeah, he's just it was excellent and made my life possible. Um, but the other thing to say, again, I think I come back to, you know, behavioural economics and stuff like that. We all learn loads of really relevant stuff to pricing. Is it how you anchor a price? Is it how you frame a price? Is it how, you know, loads of stuff that actually suits don't necessarily know and lots of other people don't know about pricing. But we don't necessarily think to apply it to that kind of stuff. Um, so I think you can quite often, I always have this, you know, why don't we do differential pricing with our clients? So we say, we'll do this for one price. Um, you know, if we get access to the senior people straight away, we don't have to fanny round, show it 20 times to 10 juniors and la 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 la. We'll do that hat for that price, or you can pay all of this and it will take you months and months and months and you go through. And that, you know, just putting that on the table to people, suddenly they go, oh, maybe we should think about our process a bit more. <laughs> so you can mess around with pricing. I think if you've got the confidence of knowing you've got a good FD or somebody like that, you can then play around with it and use some of your planning skills. Quick question myself, if that's, that's what I've got. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, it's make sense, but obviously now you are CEOs, I'm not CEOs, I'm sure so a lot of people here that aren't CEOs yet. What <laughs> advice would you give to planners, us here, now that you've been a CEO, what things could we be doing more of that would make us better planners and strategists that necessarily aren't in our typical remit, if you see what I mean? To become a CEO or as a planner? No, just as a planner today. Like what, now that you've been a CEO, do you think there's any skills or things you've learned that you think planners would benefit from doing more of? Whether that's well, the phone like I mean, uh, yeah, because <coughs> I completely agree with that. 
I don't know why pandas are so rubbish at it, because it's never, again, it's not as terrifying as you think. It's not. In fact, it's really quite, yeah. it's very satisfying, and I really enjoy it now, because you always have a good conversation, yeah. and it's really helpful on every level. And I, but I still go, oh, yes, maybe I'll just write an email, or maybe I'll put that off until tomorrow. And then I go, no, no, you won't, that's not working. Um, but I think, as well, it's about, um, well, something that pandas do really, really well at now is understanding the business the business, your client's business, really their business, not the marketing bit of their business, but their business. And I know it's part of your role, but when you get to CEO, you're not going to be sitting with them over lunch having a chat about the advertising as much as you are about what's keeping them awake about the pricing or the distribution or actually the product development in India or something else. And so I would always say, and I know you do this as planned already, but constantly ask bigger, broader questions about what your what contribution you're making because it's not what your then counterpart CEO is worried about. He's not worried about the bloody advertising uh, or the communications, really, or the customer journey. He's just not, or she, I should say. Um, and so I think the more you can do to understand and get breadth and experience and appreciation for the much bigger, broader facets that make up a good business or a bad business, the better equipped you will be to have those conversations at that level. Yeah, totally agree with that. The, um, the only other sort of thing I guess is that I think I now appreciate um, better the thing that everyone always says but you, you kind of don't really appreciate what clients are looking for is certainty and predictability because they are trying to manage the expectations of their bosses in the same way I was trying to manage the expectations of my bosses we are going to be able to deliver that target. We are going to hit those margins, da da da. And you don't like uncertainty. Um, and I don't think we're very good, although you know we kind of intellectually know that that's what they need. They need certainty because they're going to have to talk to their board and they're going to say this is going to work in this way. I don't think you necessarily feel that as a planner. Once you've actually experienced it from the other side i think you you have a bigger appreciation for that and i think you then have a bigger appreciation for those clients who are super brave and to go for stuff um and you really put their necks on the line i think you appreciate it a load more um and you have an ability to kind of spot them love them do everything you possibly can for them um because you really understand it